Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So continuing my series today on signaling devices. In the first video I demonstrated the bare flare versus the standard road flare. Today we're going to be discussing the ins and outs of orange smoke flares, both floating and handheld. Now these are primarily for use for marine purposes, but they also serve a vital function for terrestrial based search and rescue. So let's check them out. Alright, so before we start the video, I want to explain a little predicament that I'm in. I purchased a crap load of different types of signaling devices with the hope of selling them through my website, only to realize that in Canada, in order to ship this stuff, because it's classed as a 1.4 explosive, it's going to cost people an arm and a leg in extra shipping fees. So until I get a brick and mortar store, that's not going to be a possibility. So what I want to know, because I have this excess surplus in the meantime, do you guys have any ideas or any different things you would like me to test with regards to these? Now, I have all kinds of flares. I have the 12 gauge launcher flares. I have handheld launcher flares. I got smoke flares. I got bear flares. So if you have any ideas with regards to how we can do some stupid crazy stuff to kill some time, put it in the description below. Even if it involves the all-American prepper. Not that he would ever need to signal for help because signaling for help is clearly for snowflakes and pussies. I do however sell two very large kits but they're very expensive. They're only for the super rich and I don't really make a whole lot of money on them. A lot of the money goes into shipping and I'm telling you it costs a lot to ship these things. A stupid amount. So I'll post the link in the description if you still do care to get yourself a very large marine grade or multi-purpose signaling kit. I had some long distance aerial uh, shots which I was trying to demonstrate uh, how effective these were at long range through a thick bush and I actually went out three times to get the footage and only one round of footage which was the first round of footage I went out there for actually stuck so it's kind of ridiculous but I wasn't able to uh, show you the long range footage that I have of using these so I'm just gonna have to explain those testing results to you and I can say that it wasn't the greatest for long range but I'm going to talk about the, the pros and cons of my experience. But before I do that, I want to go over some of the ins and outs and maybe things that you didn't know about orange smoke flares. So the first thing you need to know about smoke flares is that they're only meant to be used in the daytime. And they're primarily for marine use. You're not going to be able to see the smoke at night. At nighttime, you're going to need some sort of incendiary flare. These flares are designed to work even underwater because they actually produce their own oxygen independent of any outside air. So they're going to work underwater. If you went overboard and you know you had one of these orange flares or if you even had one of the incendiary flares underwater, it's still going to work. So here I'm also demonstrating a floating one. Now you're not actually supposed to be holding on to these because they do get a little hot. Of course, I'm wearing gloves. It's cold outside, so I'm able to do this. But these are actually meant to float. So that's a pretty cool feature. Now in technical terms, if these are properly stored between 40 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, they're not going to expire. But if they're being stored outside in a boat and they're not sealed in a bag, then air is going to get in, moisture is going to get in. And of course, uh, if they're outside and they're in the elements, then they're probably going to exceed or go below the 40 to 90 degree Fahrenheit range, which of course is going to shorten their lifespan. So when not in use, store in a cool, dark place. Now the reason why they use orange is because orange is slightly brighter than red. And if you look on the color wheel, orange is actually the opposite of the color blue. And of course, for marine purposes, uh, to create the most amount of contrast, you want to use a color which is opposite on the color wheel. So it just so happens that orange is the opposite of blue. 
and uh, that's where you're going to get the greatest contrast. Now, this is why it's not going to be as effective in the forest, because if you look on the color wheel, the opposite of green is in fact red. Now, this makes sense as to why a lot of signal flares, which are aerial, which are meant to be used through a canopy of trees, are in fact red. Now, in spite of the fact that technically there is no expiration date, it is recommended that you do abide by the expiration dates posted on the package, which are typically three to four years out from the time of purchase. Now, if you're mainly sticking to smaller freshwater bodies of water and you only go out a few times a year and your signal flares spend most of their time in a cool, dark place, you can probably get away with using them a little over the expiration date, but use your discretion with that. They can be a little pricey, so it's a decision that you have to make for yourself. Now it's winter time here, so I can't demonstrate these flares on the water, but generally speaking, you shouldn't use a signal flare until you see a helicopter or a boat. You wanna save it for when you need it, because even though you can see and hear a boat or a helicopter from very far away, you look like a tiny little speck on the ground. If you've ever been in a helicopter or if you've ever used a drone and seen yourself from a few hundred meters up, it's very hard to spot somebody even when they're using the most advanced signaling devices. So don't use it until you see or hear a vessel. You should try to the best of your ability to be in an open plane if possible and have high contrast between you, the smoke signal, and the terrain that you're on. So if you have a tent, if you have other signaling devices, if you've drawn SOS in the sand, all those things, you wanna stay near that. You don't wanna go running far away from that because it's gonna be the signaling device in combination with your other landmarks that you have laid out that are gonna grab the rescuer's attention. So if you do find yourself on the other end of a search and rescue incident, you not only wanna rely on the flare, there's a lot of other things you can do to draw attention to yourself. Having a constant fire going and throwing some pine needles on that is going to be a natural way to create smoke. But unfortunately, that's gonna create a white smoke, which is not going to be as identifiable as the orange smoke. Now, another thing you absolutely wanna do, because I can attest to this, because when I was doing this drone footage, uh, the drone only stays up in the air for 10 to 12 minutes. So I only have a certain amount of time to get the images that I want. And it takes a good couple minutes to get the drone into position and off the ground and all that. So it really only leaves me a few minutes if I want to fly the drone back safely, of course. Uh, so I only get a few minute window. And what I found is that I was, you know, before, of course, I did briefly read the instructions, but you kind of want to run through the process. You don't want to just read the instructions. You want to take the cap off and you want to kind of go through all the motions of how you're going to use it in times of distress. Also, the caps on these things can be a little difficult to take off, especially in the winter time when the plastic is gonna expand a bit. So it's gonna be a little harder. So if your hands are cold and brittle, it might be hard for you to get it off quickly enough if there's that small window of seeing the helicopter in the sky or something like that, you wanna be able to access it very quickly. So you wanna have it on the ready, you wanna know how to use it because it may well mean the difference as to whether you're rescued or not. Now there's three different types of smoke flares I used. One is a smaller one, which is a part of a three piece a signaling kit from Orion. And that one only burns very briefly. It's nice and portable in combination with the red hand flare that they give you and the aerial flare they give you. Those three things, the triple entente, is going to increase your ability to be identified 24 seven. Because remember, you can't use a smoke flare at night. Having a smoke signal flare is only half of your signaling kit. You're gonna need a handheld or an aerial ejection uh, red flare for nighttime. Now there's two other larger smoke flares that Orion sells, and this is the general uh, size of flare that you're gonna find with most companies who make these flares, whether it's Comet or otherwise, is that there is a, a handheld one which is gonna burn for about a minute, and then there's the floating smoke single in a can which is gonna burn for three minutes. So that's a lot more burn time and it's going to create a much larger smoke plume which is going to be able to be seen from a little bit further away. But generally speaking the smoke is going to dissipate at the same rate. 
So the actual range of visibility is going to be pretty much the same with both the floating and the handheld. The only thing is that the floating is going to be lasting longer. Now these are rated to be seen from five miles on water. Now, of course, I never tested them on water. If I was in a winter environment and I was on an open plane, I could definitely see you being able to see this for five miles, especially from the air because that's going to be very high contrast anything is high contrast on white for the most part but if you're in the bush uh, what i found is that you're going to have to have a fairly good set of eyes to see it even over the 1.5 mile range but then again my drone only goes up so high uh, if you're in a helicopter of course search and rescue teams they're trained in practice in spotting out the irregularities and the inconsistencies in the environment which might indicate that somebody is there so what i'm saying is that if i can see it from 1.5 miles with a drone at only 1080p resolution then it's safe to say that they could see it much further than that based on the amount of decibels that a helicopter emits and of course it is in the air you're going to be able to hear it from probably three miles away which is pretty significant so the supposed five mile range of these things on land is not going to be that relevant because of course you're not even going to be able to hear or see the helicopter at that range most likely it goes back to rule number one is that you don't use the signal unless you know somebody is there to see it i think within one mile and dense bush even if you're in an overgrown patch and there's no open plane for you to signal from but usually there's always some place that you can make some sort of signaling landmark from i would say at one mile you are guaranteed to see this from a helicopter from almost any angle but there is one other caveat to that it's going to depend on how tall the trees are now where i was the trees are fairly tall i would say you know 40 to 50 feet at least there we're not too high up north yet so we still get decent sized tree growth now if you're on the west coast where they just have those colossal trees those jurassic park like trees this may not be a good option you're probably going to need to shoot something up and over those trees like an aerial flare something which is launched from a 12 gauge launcher or something to that effect but these are preferred in the daytime because the red aerial flare it's a small little blip of light and in broad daylight you're barely ever going to see it unless your eyes are trained on the location that it happens it does make a bit of a sound which will travel maybe a mile under good conditions but a helicopter pilot is not going to be able to hear that over the sound of itself so don't rely on that now i'm going to do another video which is all about doing aerial signaling using aerial flares and i'm going to demonstrate and talk more about the limitations of use and i'm hopefully going to get some nighttime shots for you as well because like i say i got a lot of inventory to burn and i don't want all american prepper to just get a hold of it and waste it all so i want to make some of this educational as well now in terms of using orange smoke flares for preppers you can go and make this stuff but if you want to make the good stuff some of the ingredients not necessarily illegal to purchase in canada but you might get yourself on some kind of watch list or something like that and it's never going to be as good as what you can buy it's just and for something for emergency use 90 percent of the time that you're going to use something like this it's not going to be in an shtf situation only your personal shtf situation now the uses for preppers are obvious number one of course signaling in an shtf situation if you live in a community of acreages or farms which are a kilometer or so away you can of course use it for that purpose in most post-collapse fiction we see this as a strategy used by the characters it can also be used as a diversion not for extraction purposes like a smoke grenade uh, because this is going to be directing and shooting it in one direction so it's not going to be equally diffuse in 360 degrees so it might not you know fumigate an entire area as quickly as you would like so that it would provide you that sort of cover but just a diversion in the sense of you know if you wanted to attract somebody to one area while you were off doing something else in another area there's a potential use for that now it could also be used to 
smoke people out, but anybody with half a brain would simply grab this thing, pick it up, throw it out of the hole. But I can tell you it is a very noxious gas. It will smoke people out. Not as much as tear gas, but if you're in a confined space with this, it's unbearable. And I know this because I set one off in my garage to test out my gas mask. I pulled my gas mask off. I couldn't stand there for more than 10 seconds. I show myself on footage trying to breathe it in and it's it's bad. I think I actually probably gave myself cancer in doing that or something. I do not advise you to do that at all. But uh, fortunately, I made it out alive. So check out the links in the description. I hope you found this video useful. If you have any questions about this or anything else, email me at canadianpreparedness at hotmail.com. You can post your questions in the comment section. I may or may not get a chance to view them. Unfortunately, I get hundreds and hundreds of comments every day across all my videos. I would love to be able to respond to all of them, but I simply cannot. I do, however, read a good majority of them, and I appreciate you commenting, liking, and subscribing if you enjoy the video. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper Out. The best way to support this YouTube channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com or BugOutRoll.ca. Premium quality gear at the best possible price using the incredibly secure and easy to use Shopify platform. We offer free shipping to the United States for orders over $200 USD and free shipping to Canada over $75. So support the channel by supporting yourself.